So as President Brown said, I, I attended the Advanced Nuclear State Collaborative in Richland, Washington, April 26th and 27th of this year. I was the, the, this state collaborative was initiated by Nehruk and Nasio and supported by the Department of Energy. And I was the Montana PSC designee. Next slide, please. So the purpose of the collaborative was to enhance the understanding of regulatory and policy questions surrounding consideration and deployment of new nuclear generation, to offer support from experts while participating in, in real-time learning. Next slide. For some brief background, things that you probably already know, to significant degree. The first generation of nuclear power plants were developed in the 1950s and 60s, second generation in the 70s and 80s, third generation 1990s and, and 2000s. So with each generation there's been improved safety, all using, but they continued to all use water as a coolant and enriched uranium for fuel. Fourth generation nuclear power refers to a new class of advanced nuclear reactors that are designed to be safer yet, more efficient, and more sustainable than previous generations of nuclear power plants. These reactors incorporate advanced materials, designs, and cooling techniques. Next slide, please. So advanced nuclear reactors have inherent safety features that prevent the release of radioactive materials in the event of an accident or malfunction. They are more efficient with higher conversion rates of nuclear fuel to electricity, more sustainable and flexible with ability to use nuclear waste as fuel and the potential to be used in a variety of applications and settings, including remote locations and microgrids. They're still working on greater scalability and waste issues. For a little more information, nine out of 10 advanced reactor designs selected for the for the United States government funding will require advanced fuel such as high assay, low enriched uranium or HALIU. U.S. uranium enrichment capability has dwindled such that we lean heavily on other countries to supply our fuel for our nuclear plants. Earlier this year, the U.S. Department of Energy selected American Centrifuge Operating, a subsidiary of Centris Energy, to demonstrate HALIU production at the department's enrichment facility in Piketon, Ohio. Also earlier this year, the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission, or NRC, issued its final rule in the Federal Registry to certify New Scale Power's small modular reactor. The company's power module becomes the first SMR design certified by the NRC. Next slide, please. Invited were representatives of states considering or actively working toward the deployment of advanced nuclear reactors. Present were more than 30 members of state utility commissions and state energy offices representing 23 states. Ben Brower, Montana Department of Environmental Quality Bureau Chief was there and we were in some of the, uh, the same small groups so we had significant opportunities to discuss the various topics at hand. Next slide please. So the format was lectures and discussions and also field trips. Next slide. The lectures and discussions included nuclear energy overview, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory and Framatone overview, and, and those uh, discussions and lectures pertinent to the field trips. Next slide. So Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, or PNNL, is one of 17 U.S. Department of Energy National Laboratories. They work on, among other things, advancing solutions for long-term United States nuclear deployment and security, also energy resiliency through expertise in various aspects of the power grid. They made national news last January with developing the most cost-effective method for carbon capture so far. Next slide. So the lab tours of PNNL included radiochemical processing, material science and technology, waste form development, metal organic framework, cable degradation management in nuclear facilities. Next slide. The other field trip was to Framatome, which is a nuclear fuel manufacturing facility, one of three leading centers in the United States for innovation in fuel design and fabrication of nuclear fuels. Next slide. So, Fuel Design Research Centers, where they have innovative fuel designs that include pressurized water reactors and boiling water reactors. Um, innovative fabrication includes optimizing uranium dioxide power pellets and fuel rod assemblies. This is a, a Framatome worker assembling rods. Next slide. 
This is the one I added this morning. Thank you, Trevor, for doing that. Really appreciate it on such short notice. Uh, this morning, I remembered my initial reaction to the workers handling these uranium fuels with minimum gloves and rarely using protective suits or any, really any protection of any kind. So it was just a little bit surprising. So I thought I, this morning, I thought I'd bring some of this in. Um, and next, and we've got a bunch of different things there. Just shows, see there, them just kind of chilling by the pool of, of spent nuclear rods. And just shows, you know, uranium's all around us. It's, these are all non-reactive. Next slide. This is where the work takes place. Um, and even though the workers are not exposed to activated uranium, they are checked every day for, for any ionized radiation going in and out, they are checked. And we were checked going in and out of many of these facilities. And I asked the engineers if anyone has ever had a significant, if there was an increased incidence of cancer or if there, there, there were more congenital abnormalities of their children, and they said not that they know of. Next slide. So there were many lectures and also discussions of experiences with new nuclear generation, including some individuals expressing frustration with trying to get nuclear going in their state and so on. During the closing session, the attendees rated their top three concerns. Next slide, please. And these were made into a composite. So they had all of us write down our, our three biggest concerns and then they they had us all place them on the on a board and they, they put them together. And so these were the top concerns for the people that attended. Cost to the rate payer was number one. Disposal and recycling of nuclear waste, number two. Availability of transmission and metals. Choosing the, the siting locations and, and also citizen resistance. Next slide. The takeaways were many. There's no substitute for hands-on and opportunities to ask questions of experts. The burgeoning information is available to address questions about structure, function, regulation, and other policies regarding deployment of new nuclear generation. Naruk and NASIO provide ongoing assistance. Next slide. So since that April 2023 visit to Richland, uh, within a week, you know, they said, the organizers said they would provide study materials uh, and follow up with us, and they have. Within a, a week, they emailed us a tremendous number of resources, links to the presentations, handouts, notes, and photos from the meeting. Also, NARUC's nuclear resources, including briefing papers and resources from past public webinars, the ANSC resource repositories. That was within a week. Uh, June 22nd, there was a webinar discussion about the Department of Energy's Advanced Nuclear Liftoff Report, which I'll talk a little bit more about. September 27th, yesterday, there was another webinar discussion evaluating nuclear waste and safety consideration for advanced nuclear deployment. And during this webinar, participants learned about the characteristics of spent fuel produced by advanced reactors, prospects of reprocessing advanced reactor fuels, and NRC's new SMR emergency planning zone rule. This is a disclaimer. Um, the statements that follow from here on are uh, reg regarding the Department of Energy and NARUC's opinions about nuclear power are not to be construed as reflective of the opinions of the Montana Public Service Commission, including this commissioner. Next slide. So this Department of Energy, the pathway to advanced nuclear commercial liftoff, this was the topic of the June 22nd webinar. Nuclear power, one of the few, this is a quote from them, nuclear power, one of the few proven options that can deliver the scale of clean carbon-free electricity needed. Complements renewables, low land use and lower transmission requirements for build out, additional applications enable grid flexibility and decarbonization beyond the grid. So those are Department of Energy's positive points. Indus, this is a quote too, industry, investors, government, and the broader stakeholder ecosystem each have a role to play in ensuring the advanced nuclear industry accelerates towards commercial liftoff and rises to meet the challenge in a way that meets the country's climate, economic, and environmental justice imperatives. Next slide. So after the June 22nd, with a discussion of the different attendees, um, no one wants to be first to do one of these. That was very, very clear. Um, the cost, is there financing available? That was another big concern. And then the nuclear waste concerns. So you could see the overlap at the, at the end of, of the April meeting, about the same as after more information was given and we had more, had the webinar. Next slide, please. 
so this is over to the, the meeting that was yesterday regarding nuclear waste. This is a quote from Nehruk. State energy offices and state utility regulators are exploring ways to plan for the growth of advanced nuclear over the next decade to harness the clean energy, grid reliability, economic development, and other benefits new nuclear generation can provide. Understanding how advanced nuclear reactors will address and account for nuclear waste and safety is a vital consideration for these planning processes, end of quote. Next slide, please. So the U.S. Regulatory Commission, NRC, has directed its staff to issue a final rule and associated regulatory guide that applies risk-informed, performance-based emergency preparedness requirements to small modular reactors, SMRs, and other technologies. The rules emergency preparedness framework adopts a technology-inclusive and consequence-oriented approach. Applicants and licensees for SMRs and other new technologies can use this rule in developing a performance-based emergency preparedness program as an alternative to the current off-site radiologic emergency planning requirements. Next slide. So discussion with attendees. One of the big ones, uh, there were so, two attendees from New York that discussed their West Valley project of ongoing cleanup of nuclear waste that has cost billions of dollars, including $300 million in state money. And so the different people that have ex actually experienced the problems with nuclear waste in their states, they said it's really important that any advancements be with eyes open regarding the status of waste repositories that currently have to still be on site. And as far as cost and financing available, states like Montana that don't currently have nuclear power and SMRs are not currently in any IRPs, we are required to promote least cost resource and cost fe feasibility based on, on speculative models. So that's gonna be an ongoing conversation and there's a lot of information available. Thank you so much. I'm available for questions and if there's any questions I can't answer, I have a lot of people that I can contact to get the answers to those. Thank you, Commissioner Bukacek. Thank you so much. Madam Chair, one housekeeping matter. I forgot to hand out the uh, regulatory update from the commission, so with the chair's permission, I'd hand that out. Of I know course. you wanted some more paper. <laughs> But to your comment, Senator Usher, I do uh, very much support the timber industry. And the reason that is is because when I was in high school, my best friend's dad lost his job at Stoltz Lumber when they closed that out, down at Dillon, and I'll never forget that. 